Does the Catholic Church dogmatically teach that it is good to burn heretics or that it is the will of the Holy Spirit to burn heretics for, obviously, heresy? We are asking this question because it comes up very often. I've seen it brought up many times by Protestants. I've even recently seen it brought up by an Eastern Orthodox as an objection against the Catholic Church. Um, and I want to play a very brief clip where this is being discussed between two Catholics. So it also comes up in discussions between Catholics. Um, so I think it's certainly worth addressing. Now, the discussion that I'm referring to specifically is the one between Trent Horn and Timothy Gordon. This was a discussion that they had several years ago. They did one on the death penalty, and they did one on can Christians be feminists. I want to commend both of them for these discussions. I already did a discussion earlier, a few days ago, when I was in Costa Rica. I reviewed the feminism issue, the discussion that they had. And what I want to do is hone in on one particular segment from their discussion on the death penalty. Perhaps I'll do a longer evaluation of their discussion at a later time. I just want to hone in on one part that specifically concerns this topic as it relates to the document Exerge Domine by Pope Leo X. Um, I, again, I know that this was done several years ago. I know I'm late to the game <laughs> in reviewing some of this, but better late than never. Um, I was aware of the discussion when it came out, but I was not able to listen to it. And then after a while, I, um, you know, it, um, uh, slipped my mind and I didn't recall that I need to go back and listen to it. However, when I was in Costa Rica, I had, uh, some MP3s downloaded onto my phone for me to listen to when I don't have access to the internet. And since I didn't have access to the internet in Costa Rica at certain parts, especially when I was driving to Panama, I was looking through my phone to listen to some podcasts and boom, there it was. So I said, let me listen to this. So <laughs> late to the game, but you know what? Better late than never. Uh, but I, first of all, want to, you know, say I appreciate both of these gentlemen for their uh, very helpful discussion. Um, on both of these topics. I appreciate that they were willing to have these discussions because how common is that nowadays? It's very hard to find Catholics who disagree with each other who will have discussions with one another. It's very common to see people who agree with each other having discussions, but when people have a disagreement, that's a little bit more unusual. So I really appreciate that both of them were willing to come to the table and have these discussions. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for it, and I thoroughly enjoyed them. Uh, so I, I've certainly found them entertaining. And if you haven't listened to them, go and check them out. I mean, if you just type in on YouTube, can Christians be feminists, Trent Horn, Timothy Gordon, that will come up. And the second one is uh, should Catholics support the death penalty with Timothy Gordon Trent Horn? Just type that in. It'll come up. I don't think there are any YouTube videos, unfortunately. It's just podcast. I wish there were video, but you know what? Audio is better than nothing. The, the audio is still great, so I enjoyed it. Um, let's play a segment of the audio, the relevant portion. And then what I want to do is evaluate the comments that are made. Um, about Exerge Domine here. Uh, by going to Exerge Domine and comparing what is said with the document itself, and then I also want to briefly address the dissertation of Dr. King, Lawrence King, on um, the authoritative weight of non-definitive magisterial teachings and uh, his section that deals with this, because his section is going to back up what I'm saying so that you see it's not just merely my opinion, but you have other scholars who are um, expressing the same same evaluation of exerge domine. So it's not just you know limited to my opinion. Um, however, it is it is something that you don't see addressed often. So if you were to do a Google search of what I'm about to go over, you're you won't find it. Uh, this is one of those things that's it's it's unfortunate 
because it's very important, but it's just not discussed very often, uh, which is what I'm trying to do here with the channel is, is bring more awareness of how the magisterium works on a popular level, because I think we need it desperately because it is going to come up constantly in apologetic discussions. Um, you know, discussions that we have with other people who are Catholics, who share our beliefs, and those who don't share our beliefs, whether they, um, you know, are, are Catholics who have a different view or non-Catholics and, you know, whatever. You're, you'd be shocked how many questions revolve around discussions related to the magisterium. And this one, like I said, comes up often because I hear it often from Protestants and even some Eastern Orthodox. So let's let's evaluate what is said here. A uh, very uh, brief clip. Uh, let me share my screen, enable audio. And this is around the, uh, let's see, 38 minute and 13 second mark. Let's maybe back it up just slightly. 3807, let's see. Do that, as long as it has punishments that protect the common good of society. So when it comes to retributivism, you could say, look, our theory of justice is that the most severe crimes deserve the most severe punishment. Mm -hmm. So you could cap that most severe punishment wherever you want, and you, you still have retributive justice here. I have no, I have no problem with that. But, but I'm saying something you said earlier that I, I felt I should have pounced on is the crime of heresy. Uh, it's anathematized in 1520. All right. So here's that's the first part. I'm going to play more, to, but I, I want to point that out. He's saying that is anathematized All right. in 1520. And he doesn't refer to the document, but yeah, it's it's obvious in 1520 what you have exerge domine. It's obvious what he's referring to. So um, Pope Leo X uh, released exerge domine excommunicating Martin Luther and um Along with excommunicating Martin Luther, he condemns various propositions. One of them involves what is being referred to here. All right, so uh, let's let's listen to it. Listen to the rest, but let me let me back it back up. As long as it has punishments that protect the common good of society. So when it comes to retributivism, you could say, look, our theory of justice is that the most severe crimes deserve the most severe punishment. So you could cap that most severe punishment wherever you want and you you still have retributive justice here i have no i have no problem with that but but i'm saying something you said earlier that i i felt i should have pounced on is the crime of heresy uh it's anathematized in 1520 um as luther was anathematized the pope says let him be anathema who says that we can't burn heretics all right so there it was let him be anathema who says uh, he can't burn heretics. I'll play it again, but um, obviously he's he's not directly quoting from the document himself. Himself, he's he's just speaking extemporaneously. Um, but I want to evaluate whether or not that is true. Right? Uh, what was said? I'm not necessarily holding to him to verbatim, but did did Leo X actually condemn that proposition um, as anathema? That's the question. By the way, I see you in the chat. Uh, Observe scandal asking me, does exerge domine mean something like the great resurgence of God? No, it's it's from the Psalms. That's um, a lot of documents start out with the very first Latin words in the document, and he's quoting from the Book of Psalms, which speaks of arise, O Lord, you know, arise, O Lord, and something your vineyard for wild boars has taken over your vineyard or something like that. I forget, I forget what the. It, it, it's, it's to that effect, you know, arise, O Lord, cleanse your, your vineyard because wild boars are in your vineyard. And Martin Luther is the wild boar. So, um, is it, however, the case again, that that was anathematized? Let's listen to it one more time. As long as it has punishments that protect the common good of society. So when it comes to retributivism, you could say, look, our theory of justice is that the most severe crimes deserve the most severe punishment. So you could cap that most severe punishment wherever you want, and you you still have retributive justice here. I have no I have no problem with that. But but I'm saying something you said earlier that I I felt I should have pounced on is the crime of heresy. Uh, it's anathematized in 1520 um, as Luther was anathematized. The Pope says, "Let him be anathema who says that we can't burn heretics." Mm -hmm. um, 
So, yes, I agree. It sounds strange. Now, Trent says, mm -hmm. now that doesn't necessarily mean he agreed with what he was saying. Could just mean like, mm -hmm, I'm following the conversation, but I'm not necessarily agreeing with, you, uh, with what you're saying. So I don't know if Trent agrees with that interpretation. I um, I, I don't exactly know what the mm -hmm meant there because I, I could interpret it in multiple ways. Sometimes I say mm -hmm, to somebody, in other words, saying I'm following you. I don't agree with you, but I'm, I'm following you. Um, or mm -hmm, could mean I agree with that interpretation. So I don't know where uh, Trent necessarily stands on this, um, but I do know where Timothy stands on this, according to uh, what he just said there. And that's what I, I want to evaluate, because I do hear this often from Protestants and also, as I said, from some Orthodox as an objection against Catholics. And um, it often, of course, comes up in death penalty discussions as they're having a death penalty discussion. It's being brought up here. Uh, but, uh, you know, sneak peek, I'm going to say that that that's false. Uh, not only does he not say those words, that the, even the meaning, that meaning is not communicated. So even if we're going to say, well, I think, Michael, you're being too strict with Timothy. He was just kind of paraphrasing. Well, I understand that. Look, when sometimes when we speak off the cuff, um, we we kind of paraphrase. I totally get that. I do. I have to do that all, also. So I'm, I'm sure he didn't have the document in front of him. So he's, he's just kind of having to go based on memory. But what I'm saying is even, even that meaning is not communicated. Um, and, and so I think that we need to be aware of this and also aware of what is actually going on with Exerge Domine as this relates to uh, burning heretics. Because uh, I think he was indicating it would be heretical to deny uh, that it is... Um, or heretical to say that it is the will of the Holy Spirit, um, or to say it's not the will of the Holy Spirit to burn heretics. Uh, sounds like he was indicating uh, this has the note of heresy. Let's listen to it one more time just to make sure that I'm not misquoting him. I think that heresy was 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 brought up here. Wherever you want, and you you still have retributive justice here. I have no. I have no problem with that, but but I'm saying something you said earlier that I I felt I should have pounced on is the crime of heresy. Uh, it's anathematized in 1520 um, as Luther was anathematized. The Pope says, "Let him be anathema who says that we can't burn heretics." Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I agree. It's so he doesn't use the word heresy there. He doesn't use the word heresy. There. However, when we do use anathema. Um, it, it it certainly could carry the connotation of of heresy, but not not absolutely because you you could have an anathema that's disciplinary, or you could have an anathema that applies to a secondary object. And technically, denying a secondary object would not be uh, heretical. Um, it would only be denying a primary object of infallibility that would be heretical. So he doesn't necessarily, from what I'm hearing from him, he doesn't necessarily assert that this is dogma. Uh, but he does say that this is what is anathematized. Uh, so let's let's evaluate exerge domine and see if that's in fact the case. So, um, of course, again, exerge domine document by Leo X, 1520, uh, condemning the errors of Luther. Again, starts out, arise, O Lord, judge your cause, remember your approaches, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's once again excommunicating Luther, but it's also condemning various propositions. You'll see the propositions beginning here one through uh 41 so 41 propositions are condemned one of the condemned propositions is the claim that heretics be burned is against the will of the holy spirit so against what what leo the 10th is doing is he is condemning the proposition that says heretics be burned is against the will of the spirit um that's condemned by leo the 10th so that that much is true. Is it anathematized? Is it anathematized? That's the question. You have what's called, if you look later in the document, actually, you'll notice here, it does not say, let him be condemned, let him be anathematized, as we heard. It does not say that right here. Um, neither does it say immediately proceeding here, although you do have some language uh, earlier in the document, and you have some language uh, lower here in the document uh, where he says this. 
with the advice and consent of these our venerable brothers with mature deliberation on each and every one of the above theses and by the almighty authority of almighty god the blessed apostles peter and paul and of our own authority here we go we condemn reprobate and reject completely each of these theses or errors as either okay now listen is he saying each one of these propositions that we saw above each one of those, one of which is the proposition that heretics be burned is against the will of the Holy Spirit. Each of them are condemned as, notice that, either. Notice the word, either. Not all of the above, but either. Either heretical, which could be an anathema, right? Um, but specifically, that, that isn't an anathema. In fact, anathema doesn't even, even come up in the document. Um, so he doesn't explicitly say this is anathema anywhere in the document, let alone does he say that particular proposition is anathema. Uh, but he says it's either heretical or scandalous or false or offensive to pious ears or seductive of simple minds and against Catholic truth. So it's one of those things. That's what we call global censor. Instead of giving each proposition and then giving a specific censor behind this, you know, saying a good work done very well is a venial sin, condemned as heretical. The heretics be burned against the will of the spirit, condemned as offensive to pious ears. Instead of listing the specific censor for each proposition, he does, that is Leo X, Leo X does the lazy way of doing the magisterium, which is giving us a global censor, which isn't very helpful in my opinion, because it's like saying, look, you know what? I'm going to give you dinner tonight. Come on over to my house. I'm going to give you dinner. And what I do is I go to the grocery store and I buy everything to make pizza. Bring you to my house and you walk in the door. Yeah, I got dinner for you. And it's like all the ingredients are still in the fridge. Nothing has been cooked. <laughs> I, I, I bought you dinner, right? I got you dinner. I mean, the cheese is in the fridge. The pepperoni is in the fridge. The crust is in the fridge. But I didn't make it for you. You got to make your own pizza, but, you know, I got you dinner. Oh, okay, well, thank you. I guess it's better than nothing. I mean, you did get me pizza. It's just that like some assembly is required here. <laughs> well, that, that's the same thing. Whenever a global sensor is employed, it's a lazy way of doing the magisterium. It's like, I'm, I'm going to give you something here, but I'm going to leave most of the work for you, you theologians to figure out on your own. Oh, thank you, Holy Father. I guess maybe <laughs> better than nothing. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I've always found global censors to be just really lazy. Can you just please individually condemn the proposition for me and tell me what note and what censor uh, applies to each proposition? I think that would be helpful. Instead, theologians have to figure it out. Okay. So those can those propositions. One of them could be heretical. Ten of them could be scandalous. One of them could be false. 30 could be offensive to pious ears. You know, he doesn't tell you. He doesn't tell you how many are going to be witch or blood, or it could even be that one of them is a combination of several of these things. It doesn't tell you. You got to figure it out on your own. Um, so by employing this global sensor, is he saying that this is heretical to say that heretics be burned against the will of the spirit is heretical? No, he doesn't say that. Does he say it's anathema? No, he doesn't say that. Um, it could be that that proposition is heretical. Could be, but he doesn't tell you. Some assembly is required. You got to figure it out on your own. Uh, it could be that it's just scandalous. It could be that it's just false. It could be that it's just offensive to pious ears. It could be that it's just seductive of simple minds. All right. So the burden of proof is going to be on the person who asserts that this proposition is condemned as um heretical the burden of proof is going to be on that individual to demonstrate that which i don't think can be done uh, i think it's a fool's errand i don't i don't think that anybody could demonstrate that uh it's considered to be heretical to give that proposition i certainly think that you could say it's offensive to pious ears and the reason why is god did allow for the death of heretics in the old testament for example so when you have Deuteronomy 18, you have a false prophet teaching other gods. They were to condemn that person to death. They were to stone that false prophet. 
Um, that's putting to death heretics right there in the Old Testament. God allows for that. Um, so to say that it's against the will of the Holy Spirit to then burn a heretic, uh, well, if you can stone a heretic in the Old Testament, I, I don't know why burning would be that much different, to be honest with you. Um, so it would be offensive to pious ears to say that it's against the will of the Spirit when God allowed for the stoning of heretics in the Old Testament. Does that mean that God still allows for the burning of heretics in the New Covenant? That does not logically follow. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. That doesn't logically follow, though, though that just because it was allowed in the Old Testament that it's somehow allowed in the New. could be that God, uh, though saying it's not intrinsically evil, doesn't allow for that in, in, in a disciplinary way, if you will. Um, but... It could be that he does allow for it, but you could see at the very least why this would be offensive to pious ears, because if you're to just give that blank blanket statement, that's going to then condemn what God allowed for in Deuteronomy 18, among other places. So um, I think my opinion is this falls under one of the minor censors, not the major censors. A major censor is going to be like heretical, erroneous. Uh, those are going to be some of the major censors. Minor censors would be like scandalous, offensive to pious ears, seductive of simple minds. Those are your minor censors. Um, I think it falls under one of those. Um, I think we could demonstrate that in the way that I just did. But I don't think that anybody can demonstrate that that proposition is condemned as heretical. But, hey, I'm open to hearing it if someone can do it. But, unfortunately, that wasn't done. It was just assumed uh, that it was anathematized and not again not only was it not anathematized but the specific uh censor isn't identified i'm thinking he, where he got the anathematized idea from was from the fact that he he mentions heresy here uh but again he doesn't identify that particular proposition as heretical so um I could totally see where somebody would come away from this. If they're not aware of a global sensor, I could completely see where somebody would read this and come away thinking that. I mean, I know I did before I was aware of global sensors. So I could completely see where somebody else could, could get that. But I, I think that I think that, that that's not the, the correct understanding. And so I think that that's why it's important to address this. Now, I want to show again that that's not just my interpretation. Uh, let's take a look at Dr. King and his dissertation. Uh, this is on page 347. Um, the authoritative weight of non-definitive magisterial teachings is dissertation at CUA, which I found to be gold. I don't agree with um, his position on dignitatis humanae. I respect his position, but I don't agree with it. So I don't agree with everything in here. But I will say this dissertation is gold. It's a gold mine. It just has so much in it. Uh, hopefully one day he can just take it and, you know, formulate it into a book. I think that'd be amazing. Anyways, it's online for free uh, if you just type in that title. But here's what he says. Throughout the Middle Ages and Tridentine era, popes and councils issued many disciplinary decrees restricting heretics and non-Catholics in the exercise of their religious beliefs. In 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council commanded Catholic princes to expel heretics from their territories. In 1415, the Council of Contents ordered all copies of John Huss' books to be burned and handed him over to be executed. By the way, it was also the Council of Contents that was the first to use um, censors. You know, these censors that we're talking about, when did those come about? Uh, to my knowledge, the earliest is the Council of Constance, which, curiously and unfortunately, uh, the church has never told us which e what, what each one of these censors means. <laughs> it's never defined what is offensive to pious ears or seductive of simple minds. It assumes that the reader already knows, um, which a good dissertation was done on this, which effectively communicates, and I think it's also Dr. King's position, that the reason why the church never defined each one of these censors is because it just assumed that you would interpret them according to their prima facie meaning. In other words, it it means what it sounds like it says. <laughs> offensive to pious ears means exactly that. Offensive to pious ears. It sounds bad. Um, but, but anyways, I, I, I digress. Uh, but these decrees were disciplinary teaching doctrine at, at most implicitly. Based on their research on this topic, Avery Dulles concludes 
there was no formal teaching regarding l religious liberty prior to the 19th century, and Brian Harrison finds only one instance of such teaching in Leo X's bull Exerge Domine. Exerge Domine condemns the following proposition. The heretics be burned is against the will of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit. But this bull ends with a global censor making it unclear whether this proposition is condemned as heretical, as false, or as merely seductive of simple minds. So there you go. He's, he's saying the same thing. And somebody's asking, what is a censor? Now, censor is not, not S-E-N-S-O-R. Uh, we're, we're talking about the censor. Uh, let me, I can always spell by typing things out. C-E-N-S-U-R um, is, is the kind of censor we're talking about. And a censor is going to be... Um, uh, just that, censoring what you've said. I am condemning what you've said in one way or another. Um, uh, again, you have minor censors and major censors. Um, heretical, um, even false would be part of a major censor or the major censors. Uh, seductive of simple minds, offensive to pious ears, stuff like that is going to be minor censors. Um, there's a debate on whether or not minor censors are, can be taught infallibly. Um, I actually say that that is within the scope of the church's infallibility is that uh, uh, the church could say definitively, this is offensive to pious ears. How can it do that? Has God div divinely revealed something is offensive to pious ears? No, but it could be as a secondary object of infallibility. It's something that the church could infallibly teach as necessary to maintain to maintain something that is revealed by God. So I would argue that you could infallibly teach something is offensive to my pious ears. However, just because you can infallibly teach a minor censor doesn't mean it is always true in every age. The major censors would always be true in every age because now we're dealing with just truth propositions, right? If something is true 100 years ago, it's true now um, as far as a teaching, right? Um, but something that is offensive to pious ears could be offensive to pious ears a hundred years ago, but not offensive to pious ears today. It just depends on the circumstances. Something that sounds bad a hundred years ago might not sound bad today, but it could be infallibly true that a hundred years ago it did sound bad. So I would say that even if you have a reversal, if you will, of a minor censor, it's still infallibly true at that time if the Pope used infallible language. Uh, with a minor censor, uh, that at that time it was definitive. Uh, but that's not the same as saying you can reverse a, a, a truth proposition that is definitive. No, if it's true 100 years ago, it's true today. Uh, so again, that being said, just because it is offensive to pious ears to say that heretics be burned is against the will of the Spirit in the 1500s doesn't necessarily mean that today. I mean, it could still be offensive to pious ears. But it also, maybe it isn't. Uh, what is an example of a minor censor? Yeah, let, let me actually give you, there was a really good one. Uh, let me find it here. I could give you some off my uh, off the top of my head, but let me give you a better one here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I might not be able to find it, so I'll just have to give you one off the top of my head. Um, okay. Um, it could be offensive to pious ears to say Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. I mean, or, you know, um, that's true, right? It's, it was true, but she didn't remain one, right? But you could give the impression that she remained one, so that, that could be offensive to pious ears. Or... Um, you could say Peter was a denier of the faith. Well, that could be offensive to pious ears because it's true he denied our Lord, but he repented of that, right? So you might be giving people the wrong impression if you just kind of give that blanket statement. Um, so something could be offensive to pious ears. Just because it's offensive to pious ears doesn't mean it's not true. It could be still true, but it's offensive to pious ears because of the way you're expressing it. It, it would be like, I, I think one of the examples was, Something like this. Pray for us, St. Peter, denier of the Lord. <laughs> Pray for us, St. Mary Magdalene, prostitute. 
that's offensive to pious ears. Is it true that that person engaged in that? Yeah, but it's also true they repented. So it's not appropriate for us to identify them as a prostitute or a denier of the Lord. Um, it, it's not fitting in, in, in that sense. Um, so that, that would be an example of something that's offensive to pious ears. Obviously, you know, um, examples may abound. But those are just just a few. But either way, I, I do think that that proposition that is being discussed in um, Leo the Tenth is a minor censor, uh, which just means that that doesn't even necessarily mean that it falls under the minor censor today. Um, and if we're going to say that no, it's more, uh, it's it's deeper than that. It falls under a major censor like the censor of heresy. Okay, well, you, you have to demonstrate that. You have to show why. So you would have to then demonstrate um, where the church has dogmatically defined that it is the will of the Holy Spirit to put to death uh, heretics. Good luck with that one. Good luck with that. When has the church ever dogmatically defined that? Or even um, definitively, as definitive Catholic doctrine, when, it, when has it ever solemnly defined that? It never has solemnly defined it. Okay, well, what about non-solemn definitions? Has, has, it, has it, by the ordinary and universal magisterium, proposed this as something definitive? I don't think so. I don't, I don't believe it has. Um, your work is cut out for you if you're going to take that position. So that's why I say I don't think that one can maintain that this falls under any of the major, um, major censors. Now, somebody might say, well, maybe in one of the major censors that isn't definitive. Okay, so, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, so, some kind of censor that would pertain to non-definitive Catholic doctrine or something like that. Oh, okay, but you still have to demonstrate where the church is actually taught that it is the will of the Holy Spirit to put to death heretics. I don't know where it's taught such a thing. Um and okay, if it's taught it in its non-definitive capacity, that could be reversed, right? Well, if it could be reversed, we can't say absolutely that that's necessarily the case today. Uh, so, I mean, it, it would just, that position would just create more challenges and, and more difficulty for the person who wants to maintain that. So, Again, circling back to the original um, original point here, I don't think it's the case that this was anathematized. I don't think it's the case that he was asserting that this is heresy. Um, and anybody who is going to maintain that, the burden of proof is on them. Now, again, he was speaking off the cuff, and so you know, I'm giving him a whole lot of leeway here because I know what it's like to speak off the cuff. I say things off the cuff, and I'm not always precise. Um, but that being said, it's it's also the meaning behind what he, he was saying that's not true. It's not true in any way, shape, or form um, that that was condemned in that kind of a major way. Uh, since, again, it, it could more likely be the case that a minor censor is being applied here. Uh, let me look through the chat and see what we have going on. If you have any questions, put them to at Reason and Theology. I'll do my best to answer them. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. Put it put in your comments or questions in the chat. Tell me why you don't agree. Let's hear it. Let's talk about it. Um, I just ask that you would be charitable. That's all. But nothing wrong with disagreeing with me. If you do disagree with me, maybe if you read the document in a different way, that's fine. Let me hear it. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, like to hear what you have to say. Uh, let's see here. Looking through the chat. <laughs> uh, Valentin says, I just joined the stream called Is Burning Heretics Dogma on the words, Pray for us, St. Mary Magdalene, the prostitute. I'm glad I've missed the beginning and joined just now. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not the best time to come into the stream. <laughs> Please go back and listen to the context of what I said there. <laughs> Pray for us, St. Peter, deny of Jesus. Right, that, that could be 
events of the Pius Eagles. Uh, are saying canonization is a development thing. Now, when you say development, it depends on what you mean by development. Um, you know, throughout a large part of church history, you didn't have popes canonizing saints. Saints were determined more by a popular level. Some, you know, like St. Jerome. It was just popularly canonized, if you will, but there was no papal canonization. Uh, it's just that the people receive that person on a popular level as a saint. Uh, they were a saint, or they were considered canonizing. Um, so the idea of a pope, um, you know, canonizing an individual, we could speak of that as a development since it. it, it I don't remember when the first papal canonization was, but it's certainly a late phenomenon. Um, that being said, um, they do fall within the church's scope of infallibility. So I would say that papal canonizations are infallible, but it's not absolutely essential for a pope to define who is a saint. You could have a council do so, um, and you could have that done on the popular level. You certainly don't have to have the pope. Uh, determine such things, absolutely speaking. <sighs> mm, would submitting to XRJ Dominate fall under Lumen Gentium 25? Submitting to what aspect of Lumen um, XRJ Dominate? Obvi obviously, and when you say L Lumen Gentium 25, Lumen Gentium 25 speaks of definitive papal teachings and non definitive. So are, are you asking me, does it fall under non-definitive papal teaching? Or are you asking me, does it fall under definitive papal teaching? You might have to get more specific on LG25 since it speaks of both. I suspect you're thinking of the non-definitive aspect of Lumen Gentium 25. Um, and I further have to ask more questions. You know, a document, a papal document can have multiple propositions in it, and it certainly does here. Um, so you're going to have various levels of assent given to each one of the propositions in the same document. So we don't speak of a document as infallible because you could have infallible propositions in the, a document and then non-infallible, if you will, non-definitive teachings in the same document alongside of definitive ones. Uh, so Munificentissimus Deus, for example, by Pius XII, has the definition on the assumption. Well, the definition is infallibly taught, but the rest of this stuff is generally going to be considered, depending on what, what part of the document. It could be non-definitive, it could be definitive, uh, it just depends on what proposition. So we have to think in terms of propositions, not documents. Don't think in terms of documents. Don't do that, because that's overly simplifying the situation. And I'm not criticizing you because I've made that same mistake, right? Uh, you know, I've said before that exerge domine is infallible. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> some of the propositions are going to be definitive because some of those propositions are going to be heretical, as we saw. But some of those propositions are not going to be heretical. They could be offensive to pious ears. And it could be that he wasn't definitively teaching that they are offensive to pious ears, although I would argue that he is applying the minor censors here definitively because he uses some pretty solemn language. So I would argue actually that the minor censors here are, are definitive for that time. Um, so, but, but I've made that same mistake before of just speaking, giving a blanket, you know, assertion like that, that the document is infallible. And no, it's, it's not exactly, doesn't exactly work that way because in the same document, you could have multiple propositions that are taught differently with a different weight of the magisterium. Um, uh, so you're, you're going to have to get more specific for me on that. Um, can you do a video defending the rosary? Yes, I already did one a while back, uh, probably about two or three months ago. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me find the name of it. uh go to reason and theology it was three months ago type in does the rosary detract from jesus with tk coleman go and check it out it was done really well by tk um is pope francis a heretic for invoking the grandmother spirit with pagans so um a heretic would be somebody who denies a dogma so um, in this case, was he denying any dogmas? No. But does that mean, however, that 
what he did was okay. Not necessarily because you could do something that is wrong or scandalous or immoral and not deny any dogmas, right? Um, when, um, uh, when Peter said, I don't know the Lord, was that heretical? Not exactly was that heretical, but it's a denial of Christ, right? So it's just as big of a deal, but it's it's not heresy. It's it's, it's something else. Um, now, specifically, the question of Pope Francis and the grandmother spirit with pagans. I, you know, I've seen some people address this situation and say that um, uh, what what's being meant here by the four corners isn't necessarily something that's inherently evil or pagan or what's meant by the grandmother spirit is it's referring to saint anne and that's because that's what the native americans refer to uh saint anne as as the grandmother and uh, of the west and so they were referring to saint anne the mother of mary maybe maybe not i don't know here's my concern with what happened there with pope francis is um it gives the wrong impression to them average person so let's let's say everything that was said by that individual who does the little i don't even remember what they did uh but whatever they did let's just say everything somehow checked out right let's just assume for a moment somehow none of this was inherently evil all of it can be baptized you know into christianity none of it is inherently sinful let's just assume for the moment does that still make it okay? I would still offer some pushback there and say, even if everything checked out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't participate in it. Why? Because it's going to give people the wrong impression. It's going to give people the impression that this is something pagan and the Pope is participating in something pagan. So even if he didn't, it's going to give people that impression. Is that wise? Is that prudent? Hmm. Well, uh let's see mm. would it break the infallibility rule of the church if it condemns and sentences a heretic to death then later the supposed guilty is found out to be innocent no because somebody could be sentenced as a heretic um but that's that's not somehow a definitive teaching that so and so is a heretic right um that's a that's a judgment on a particular person but that's not a definitive teaching um i don't think it falls within the scope of the church's infallibility to say that so and so um is um you know is is uh certainly in hell or, or has full consent behind heresy or something like that now you might be able to the church can say that so and so is a heretic um but whether or not it's it's formal whether or not they have full consent i don't think that's within the church's scope of infallibility because the church can't know a person's level of culpability only god can uh so i don't think that that falls within the church's infallibility what falls within the church's infallibility is that that person's teaching is in is um is heretical so so and so's teaching the church can say that's heretical but that so-and-so is a formal heretic now that's something else now the church could say that well if you're holding to this at the very least you're materially a heretic it could say that um but how could it judge the level of culpability there to say it's it's formally heretical how, how could it definitively at least do that maybe it could do that um with a good guess but as far as infallibility that's something i think is beyond the church's uh, scope of infallibility. So I don't think that falls under a primary object of infallibility or a secondary object. So showing that somebody who is condemned as a heretic later on is actually turns out they weren't heretics, such as uh, the case of St. Joan of Arc, who wasn't condemned by the church universal, but just by her local bishop. Um, but if you, if you had a, still a case like that, uh, let's say Honorius, uh, condemned by the church universal as a heretic, but it sure looks like, according to the evidence is concerned, as Bellarmine shows very skillfully, that Honorius was, was not personally a heretic. Um, does that mean that somehow the infallible organ of the, or infallible teaching of the church has now been falsified? Ecumenical councils, you know, have shown themselves to be false or something like that? No, because that, again, that doesn't fall within their scope of infallibility. 
Okay, let's see what else we have. Hmm. Um, Theophilosophia says, infallible lesser sensors. It seems to me that if something is infallible, it should be at least indirectly an object of faith, so it cannot cease to be infallible. Um, it, it, okay, so as I said before, let's say offensive to pies ears, and I think that that falls within the scope of, of the church's infallibility as a secondary object, but um, granting that for the moment, assuming I'm corrected there, um, how could we say that that is infallibly taught at this day and age, but it's no longer, it's not, it, it's not true now. Well, it, it, we can certainly say at that time, it, it's infallibly true that something is offensive to pious ears at that time, but that doesn't mean 500 years later, it's still offensive to pious ears. It's still true that 500 years ago, it's offensive to pious ears, but that doesn't mean it's offensive to pious ears 500 years later. That's how it could be infallibly taught or not taught, but applied at that time. Uh, whereas we would say that it's not necessarily the case later on. Uh, can we say that Eastern Orthodox saints declared by only a regional churches are not such by standards of Eastern Orthodoxy because regional churches and Eastern Orthodoxy cannot teach infallibly? Um, I think that we could say that uh, with local churches and particular churches of which the Eastern Orthodox, they, they are valid local churches. So this would also apply to those who are in communion with Rome, who are local churches. Um, if they have like some kind of canonization on a popular level in their particular region, um, I, I would say that there's different levels to certitude that they're canonized. Um, I don't have a problem with accepting some kind of regional council that says so-and-so is a saint, even though canonically today that wouldn't be done. But we're, we're just kind of speaking of outside of canon law, absolutely. Could this be done? Yes. I don't have a problem with that as long as we realize that that's still on a local level. That's not the same as a universal. Um, so just because somebody's received as a saint on a local level doesn't necessarily mean they are. The only thing when it comes to canonizations that falls under infallibility are universal um, uh, universal decrees of a saint, such as by a papal canonization, or the universal reception of somebody as a saint by the entire faithful. So if you don't have a papal canonization receiving somebody, what if the entire church universal received so-and-so as a saint? That, that would be infallible because it's the church universal. But local canonizations, unless they are evaluated by the church universal, are not necessarily infallible. Mm. Okay. Seraph says, yes, we should avoid even the appearance of evil. I think there's something to be said there. Um, Michael, I remember you mentioned that you can't separate the clergy from their office. What was the source you had for that? Can you remind me of the context of that? So I can think of multiple ways in which I would, may have said that. I'm trying to think specifically. Oh, something that I may have said recently. Uh, can't separate from the clergy from their office. Are you referring to people who lose office? Is, is that kind of the context here? Um, you'll have to give me more clarification. Um, uh, Gregory says, a lack of theological precision was the reasoning behind Cardinal Caetan's opposition to the global condemnation of the 41 propositions in Exerge Domine. I'd like to see what he what he said about that. Um, that'd be interesting. Uh, migrant says, great answer. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate it. Wesley asks, what's the lowest form of authoritative, non-definitive teaching, and how does it differ from the higher forms of authoritative but non-definitive teachings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there are things that would increase the weight, such as repetition, uh, the document type, uh, the whether or not the proposition is central to the text or the document. Um the, the, the verbal tenor 
of of the teaching or the the language that's used how forceful is it how how frequent is it um you know the the factors that are given in lumen gentium 25 kind of towards the end of the uh section that deals with non-definitive teachings there will we'll give you some of the things that deals with weight although um for a thorough treatment you you of course want to go to dr king's dissertation that i referenced earlier and he, he goes over pretty much everything that factors in when it comes to non-definitive teachings for the most part uh so when you ask the lowest thing uh it would be something that's taught in the lowest form of a magisterial document uh with the least bit of frequency and the least bit of force <laughs> you know um uh, <clears throat> So maybe, um, well, I'd, I'd hate to speculate and give give a particular example, but yeah, that, that's kind of what we're looking for there. Um, how does it differ from the highest form? Okay, well, you, now we're talking about something that's a hair shy short of something that is not solemnly defined or definitively taught. I mean, just a hair shy of it. That's going to be the highest form of non-definitive. So in the highest kind of document, if you will, or repetitively and consistently taught and with the most forceful language and central to the text in which it's in and stuff like that. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I meant like how a set of contests could say that the office of the papacy exists, but the Pope since Vatican II don't hold it. Yeah, so um, maybe maybe if you can tell me specifically what I said, um, my difficulty here is offices don't exist in a vacuum, right? Now, we could speak of them as kind of existing in a vacuum in... A point where you have set of a conte right between the death of two popes so we, we can speak of them somehow as abstract the office of the papacy is vacant um ordinarily the office is native to an individual but yeah i understand that we could maybe speak of it in that abstract form but my problem with them is is not necessarily that we're speaking of it in an abstract form but they're speaking of it in an abstract form for a very long period of time perpetually effectively and I think that that's what's condemned by Vatican I that speaks of perpetual successors to St. Peter. There will always be perpetual successors. I mean, can we really say that that is still true if we've had the Sea of Peter being empty for over 70 years now? Can we really speak of perpetual successors? I think that's that's too hard to maintain. Mm hmm. Um, something like you can't separate the office from the office holder. Um, generally, that's true. Generally, right? Because generally offices don't exist in a vacuum. They are native to individuals. Persons hold offices. So generally that's true. But can we speak of a period of set of Conte and therefore speak of it in the abstract. Yes, we can, but it would be absurd to speak of the Sea of Peter in that abstract way for over 70 years if we actually believe there will be perpetual successors. That's one of the problems. Um, best responses to set of Conte's arguments. I, th I really think that Cisco and Salza, um, their book, True or False Book, uh, put put the rest of the set of contest thesis in my opinion uh, have I done set of privationism uh, specifically no but not that I recall but um, I think they they're gonna fall under the same problems as set of contest so I think the same arguments apply there but I know that Cisco and Salza addressed that already so um, uh, let's see uh, Daniel 12 mentions the daily sacrifices being taken away for three years before the resurrection. Does this mean there will be no Eucharist near the end times? I don't know if I would interpret it that way. I think that we can read Daniel 12 in a way that has a literal fulfillment at that time. 
uh, as far as secondary eschatological fulfillments, you know, double meanings, double fulfillments. With a double fulfillment, it, it's not that every particular aspect has to be fulfilled in a secondary sense. They would just have to apply in a in in the you know the immediate literal sense um, for the for the primary fulfillment. Um, so I, I think I would read Daniel in a way that would be understood historically, but then I could also say there could be a double fulfillment of these things. Just like I do the book of Revelation, uh, a great deal of the book of Revelation w would be fulfilled in the first century, yet uh, we could still say there's going to be a, a greater fulfillment, a secondary fulfillment of that later on. And there are some aspects of the book of Revelation that have not been fulfilled. The new heavens and the new earth has not come yet. Um, so there are some aspects that haven't had their immediate or primary fulfillment yet. Um, you know, some of the prophecies that relate to Jesus, they had their immediate fulfillment way before Jesus, but they have a secondary fulfillment in Jesus. Um, mm. Have there been many occasions when the papal office was vacant? I think the longest period of time was about two years. And I could see two years and the concept of perpetual successor still being consistent. But I can't see 70 years and the concept of perpetual successors being consistent. Uh, not within no end in sight on top of it, you know. <laughs> Th things aren't looking up for the set of a contest, so I, I don't think they're going to get a pulp anytime soon. Um, let's see. The the Daniel chapter is explicitly before the gener general resurrection, so the sacrifice being taken away seems like it finds its primary fulfillment in pre-resurrection. Not exactly, because, I mean, you look at some aspects of Matthew 24, it's like in the immediate context of this, but it's like putting a whole bunch of stuff together that applies to 70 AD, but then applies to something at the end of time. And then it's right next to something that's still, you know, in 70 AD and something that's right next to something that would apply at the end of the time. And so sometimes you can see prophecies like collapsing things together like that. And so you could have some of that going on with Daniel 12, potentially. Uh, then again, your interpretation could be correct. I, I would need to go um, and look at it. It's been a little while. Um, 70 years is too long more than a generation. That's kind of my my thing, and that's multiple generations. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, isn't the office its own entity in canon law, though? And also canon law is multiple definitions of time, not all is linear. Well, as I said, I mean, we could speak of it in the abstract in that way. But it's just, again, offices don't generally exist um, uh, in that in that abstract sense. They, they're they they're native to an individual, especially when we're speaking of, I mean, you could have like a bishop's see become defunct, and it's not necessary for them to have perpetual successors. But when we're speaking of the bishop of Rome, uh, that's a perpetual office that will endure until the end of time. Uh, so that's going to be something that we're going to have to see perpetuity with. And so to speak of it in the abstract for over 70 years, um, I think you violated the meaning of perpetual to the point that it's no longer helpful. I think we're getting too hung up on the part where I'm speaking about they exist in a person and they're not in the abstract. Again, I was speaking generally, generally speaking, Offices are native to persons, but yes, we can speak of them in the abstract with certain exceptions, but the exceptions don't make the rule. So don't don't latch on to that and say, but there's this little exception here. I understand there's this little exception, but that little exception doesn't invalidate the primary point of what I was trying to present. Uh, so I think we're, we're getting too caught up on and hung up on uh, what I was speaking about generally there. Um, I've seen the video I sent you on Pope Liberius denying the Deutero. No, I have not seen that. Um, do a public review of it. I haven't seen it, but I mean, I think Gary Machuda has put to death most of that stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, how much work really needs to be done there. seems like Gary Machuda has put to end all that stuff, but. Um, I don't recall Pope Liberius denying the Deuterocanonicals, but I do know that a lot of these writers would speak of, or fathers would speak of them not being canonical, but then would hold to them being inspired by God. So, and would refer to them as Holy Scripture, but they would say they're not canonical. So obviously they're referring to canon in a different way than we do too. 
uh, th that we than we do today. Um, and we could speak about how they were using the term canon uh, at a later time, but it certainly differs than how we're using it today. All right. I hope this was helpful. We're at the hour mark, so I'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you all so much for watching. Hit the like button, subscribe button. Check me out, of course, at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to get access to extra stuff and support me. See you later. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.